Hello again, everybody. Um, I'm saying hello again. I'm assuming some of you were at uh, the earlier session with Trishul. Let's do some analysis of the data. Hands up if you were here with Trish. One of you. Oh, no, there you go. Good. Okay, so this, this would seem to be, thank you for engaging with that. Uh, this is the sort of logical conclusion, I think, of Trishy's points about the four kinds of analytics, the predictive analytic. Um, I said in my intro to the previous session that I didn't know a great deal about analytics. I'm now an awful lot wiser than I was an hour and a half ago, and thanks to Trish for that. Um, your speaker for this session is Matt Wicks from the Virtual Forge. And rather than me witter on, Matt, tell right. us a little about yourself yes. and what do you like to do? See what I did there? That's very good, yeah. very good. Okay, so, so uh, thank you very much, Neil. Um, I'm, as, as Neil says, I'm Matt Wicks. I'm the co-CEO for uh, technology and innovation at uh, the Virtual Forge. We specialize in, uh, in software development and particularly in innovative solutions um, and in data-driven innovative solutions as well. Um, in terms of what do I like to do? I like to do this sort of thing. I like to, to look at data. I like to predict the future from it. And I get very excited by the technological advances uh, that are happening uh, every day that are allowing us to work both uh, more accurately with data but also allowing us to begin to see patterns and make use of that data in order to, to, uh, to create processes that, that improve the quality of learning and of life in general. So I'm a bit of a geek, really, to be honest. Um, so thank you all for, for joining for this session, because I know it's the end of the second day, and it's, uh, it's always, always hard to keep an audience at the end of the second day. So hopefully there'll be something uh, entertaining and enjoyable in this session this afternoon. It's designed to be a very practical session. It's not really a session about the theory behind, um, behind predictive analytics, machine learning. It's actually a session which is a very practical session, looking at various things that you might be able to take away and do, looking at things that are largely self-service in the market today, which will have an impact on how these can be used within a learning uh, environment as well. That being said, um, I am gonna start off with a few kind of very top level uh, terms. The idea here again is obviously there'll be some people in the audience who are extremely experienced at this. There'll be some people coming to this new, some people are coming to this from the data perspective. A lot of you are coming to this from, well, what can I use here to, to, to uh, have an impact on the learning? And some people are looking at this from the perspective of, okay, what's, what's the trend? What's happening? What's coming along the line? Um, so my intention is to spend five or 10 minutes just talking about some of the the theoretical side of it, and then most of the rest of the session will be talk, taken up uh, demonstrating how you can practically apply some of these things today, very, very simply, and then talking about how they can fall into the learning sphere and influence uh, current, current work. So um, there'll be a few points during the session where I'll pause for questions and so on, uh, so, so feel free to, to chip in at those moments as well. So what I'm going to do is go through uh, an overview of what some of the terms actually mean, uh, to look at the bird's eye view of the industry today, uh, to highlight some places where you can go to try this out yourself, because everything that uh, I'm showing here can be replicated by anybody for a very, very small fee. The fee is not paid to me, incidentally. Um, to, uh, to look at how we can build a simple model for prediction. So taking some very simple data and looking at how we can use that to predict out, in this particular case, uh, projected results of a team of, of learners, two different ways in which we've done that. Uh, look at how we can understand text and break down the semantic properties of text uh, to look at how we can predict and respond to questions and how we can uh, automate that process and all the way along talking about applications for, uh, for learning. So what is machine learning? Uh, well, one quote which comes from the notoriously infallible Wikipedia is, machine learning is a method used to devise complex models and algorithms that lend themselves to prediction. Effectively, machine learning is the inversion of what we do as uh, educationists in many ways. 
it's actually teaching the machine, or in many cases, the machine teaching itself based on the information that you put into it. It's, it grew out of um, um, artificial intelligence work, and it started to really become popular in the 1990s in its own right. It's got many complex subfields of its own, which are tied very closely to both analytics, probability theory, engineering, uh, and a whole range of other things. But as I say, what we're interested in here, keeping it very practically focused, is what is it that you can do today? How can you actually make use of this if you don't have a background in data, data science and machine uh, learning as well? Uh, artificial intelligence, just in terms of getting our definitions right here, is the ability to uh, behave in a smart way and to apply intelligence to tasks. We all hear about AI, we all see AI is the future, the ability to allow machines to make decisions and act upon that. There are lots of there are lots of day-to-day -day integrations, implications of that. There's lots of things around today, both in terms of the conference and downstairs on the exhibition floor, where people are showing artificial intelligence, how it can be used, um, how it can be uh, manifested in learning. I think, um, again, what, what we're really focused on today is the machine learning part about it, about making predictions, but it's, it, the machine learning forms the basis of artificial intelligence. The intelligence that allows you to do something is all based upon what the machine has learned about the information that you've put in in the first place. One key thing that's really important to put in here, and this is kind of stating the obvious, um, but is, is really important, it always starts with the data. Because just like any other student, the machine can only learn from what you put in. And if you, if you feed a student rubbish, they're not going to learn anything. Um, and the same with the machine. You have to start with the data, and that's always where everything begins. Make sure that you understand the data that you've got. So make sure you understand what it represents, because, and that seems like a very obvious statement, but it's a very clear thing uh, that, that will become apparent as we go through these examples. Is there data missing that you could have? One of the examples I'm going to show you is about how a small amount of missing data can skew the results, and recognizing where that data is missing is important to understanding the, uh, the output that you get. Um, and are you including data just because it's there? Because one of the things, uh, and there's a very interesting paper that I'll, I'll, I'll link to later on uh, about this, is looking at the ways in which um, an oversupply of data can, uh, can impact the clarity of the results that you're looking at. Again, what we're looking at here is a process for creating generalized predictions based upon a simple workflow. Obviously, if you are a, a data scientist, if you are an AI engineer, you're working in a different field and different parameters apply. What we're talking about here is, is much more of a self-service model. Okay. A few buzzwords, input normalization and data transformation. Uh, effectively, one of the key things when you're beginning to make a prediction that you have to do is to make sure your data is good. And there are a number of processes that you go through for that. These are two of them. Effectively, uh, you need to clean up the data. You need to make sure the data is, uh, is as clean as it can be. You need to remove inconsistencies in the data. So if you've got a list, for example, of 300 scores, and all of those scores are rated between 1 and 100, and somebody's erroneously entered a score of 174, you have to go through and make sure that sort of thing is removed, because the computer, the machine, is only going to predict on the basis of what it, what it has there. Uh, you've got to select your sample. So in other words, to make sure that your sample is representative and randomized enough so that you're not forcing uh, the prediction to fit your data, you're actually giving the machine enough information to learn from in order to be able to make a genuine prediction rather than just ticking the box that this particular set of data has been matched. Um, need to make sure your scales are aligned. That's not a kind of um, reptilian thing. That is uh, related to the fact that if you are measuring everything as naught to one, which is the standard that's being used here, then you don't want to have a few sets of criteria that, that are measured from one to 100. Okay, trying to keep the scales balanced there, and make sure your data is shuffled so that you're not introducing any patterns that you may have imposed on it when you're compi compiling the data. Okay. So in the data, uh, in, the, in the machine learning process that we're going to see, there are a number of steps. The first piece is to co collect and clean your data source, to collect and clean the data that you're going to put into the process. 
The second part of the process is once your data source has been built, you want to then build the model. Now, the model is, in the simplest terms, it's the, it's the predictive model, it's the predictive engine which is going to be able to take in other information and output the specific predictions that you want to be able to do. Okay. Um, so you take the data that you've got and you split it into a model and into evaluation data, so a test set of data. Uh, you then go through the process which we'll see of teaching the machine. Uh, which is essentially a learning algorithm that runs against the data and creates the model. When we look at this in a moment in how this is done, there are, there are lots and lots of, uh, of algorithms that can be applied. And um, the example I'm going to show is a very simple one. This can be scaled up as much as you want. There are lots of automated ways of doing that. And then you take it to the next level and you have data scientists applied to creating the model again. So again, the more time, the more effort you spend on building the model, the more accurate your predictions are going to be. The predictions that we'll see today are pretty accurate, but they are definitely following a simplistic model um, that goes through. Okay. Uh, the final step that you need to go through is to evaluate the model. So effectively, this is once you've built the model, you need to look at it and say, okay, well, how accurate is this model? Is it going to be 100% accurate? Probably not. It, how, how accurate is it? How much can I rely on this? Um, so here we go. Evaluating a model is key to understanding its success and having a realistic understanding of how it can be used. If what you're wanting to do is, for example, take a model, look at a class, look at a bunch of information, and then make a prediction on where you think they will, or their, their end of unit scores, that's conceivable that that will work. If you're wanting to use it as a basis for a general trend, a way of being able to say um, from, from a... a, a from a, 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 a delivery perspective, this learner is likely to need this help, this learner is likely to need that help, absolutely, that's possible. If you're wanting to base somebody's um, salary pegging and so on off a predictive model, then the, the, you, you probably need to involve uh, data scientists rather than use the automated process that I'm going to show. There's lots of very interesting papers out there uh, related to uh, learning. One of the most interesting is the, this one, which is entitled Use of Machine Learning Techniques for Educational uh, Proposers, a Decision Support System for Forecasting Students. Great. Snappy. Uh, it's from the Artificial Intelligence Review. You can buy this online. It's £35, this paper, but it's very, it is actually really interesting. You can also download the tool that they built behind this. So the purpose of this, uh, of this paper describes the building of a tool to predict grades and the, uh, the, the processes that were gone through to create this. And there is a tool that's still available that you can download and you can run, and it will make predictions based on, uh, based on this um, information. So if you go to Artificial Intelligence Review, you can, you can download that. Now, the interesting thing about that article is it's referencing work back as far as 2002, 2003, and there's a lot of things in there that are very interesting. Um, and that's kind of um, one of the most interesting papers out there. So, Let's say you've looked at this, you've obviously got a use case where you're interested in seeing what can be done, how it can be done, where can you go to dip your toe in it? What you're looking for is a way of doing it in a, in a self-service way that's cheap um, and that is, uh, you, can, you can play around and, and play around with the results without incurring vast costs because running machine learning environments can become extremely expensive. So there are a lot of cloud providers that allow you to do this. These are four of them, AWS, Azure, IBM Bluemix, Google Cloud. Uh, all of these have their own self-service machine learning models. Uh, there, there are different benefits to each one. Each one has a different focus. Each one has a different pricing model, uh, but they're all, all largely the same. We're going to focus on AWS. Um, the, the longest established one of them. And the example I'm going to take you through now is doing a predictive analysis using um, AWS. For those of you who are not familiar with, um, with AWS, AWS is Amazon Web Services. It's, uh, a, it comes out of Amazon, obviously. It's a series of online tools which do a huge number of things, allows you to create VR, AR, allows you to do uh, to, to build games in it, allows you to create networks. It does a whole range of things. But one thing it does is it has a suite of uh, artificial intelligence tools, one of which is um, machine learning, which I'm going to take you through now. Just before we do, um, the data set that we're looking at here is a subset, subset of this data set here. Um, and it's a, a group of uh, a series of information relating to students. There are various statistics given to each student. Uh, engineering students. 
Um, the key criteria are STG, which is the degree of study time uh, for the goal object material, so the thing that they're very focused on. SCG, the degree of um, repetition number, so the number of times they've repeated something. STR, the degree of study time for the user for related objects. LPR, the exam performance of the user for related objects. And PEG, the exam performance of the user for goal objects. Uh, we're using a slightly different subset of this, but essentially this is the thing. Um, and this will then give us a score at the end of the process, which will be a categorical score. In other words, very low, low, high, medium um, in there. Okay. So I've endeavored to make this as simple and straightforward as possible so that you could replicate. Um, but let me, let me talk you through this. Um, basically, first thing you do when you go into AWS is you are given a series of options around the tools that you want to use. And I'm going to take my data set, first of all, and put my data into what's called an S3 bucket. This is just a folder. So all I'm doing here is I'm uploading the, the, a version of the CSV that you just saw um, into, um, into the, the bucket on Amazon. So I'm basically making the data available at this point to be able to be used. And I, I videoed this rather than doing it live because I wasn't wholly convinced about the uh, Wi-Fi. Um, so bear with me if I was slightly slower. So basically, literally, this is just uploading it at this point. Once the data has been uh, put into, uh, once the data has been put into S3, it's then available there, and I can go into the actual machine learning part of AWS. As I say, there are a bunch of services. Some of these are around image recognition. Some of these are around audio. Uh, some of these are around um, video analysis and so on. This one, which is called machine learning, is literally just about uh, creating predictive analytics. Um, and this one is from a prepackaged series of, uh, of tools. There is another one called SageMaker, which allows you to have much more granular control. So here I am, I'm creating my data source that I mentioned at the beginning. And in order to create my data source, all I'm doing is typing the URL of the file that I just uploaded in here. So literally just pointing this towards that data source. That data source is just that list of, of scores that are in there with the target grade, which is the, the grade on the right-hand side that I want to be able to use. Once it's actually been uploaded, I then go through a series of, of questions. And basically, this is following the wizard through. But the important point is the results that we get at the end. So once this has been upgraded, sorry, uploaded, um, I'm then able to choose the field and make sure the information that is in there is correct. So you'll see here, it's now picking out the top row of the CSV. It's saying these are the files that are there, STG, SCG, et cetera. And it's type making sure that the type of data is correct. It's numeric data. The one that's most interesting is the bottom one, which is the one that I ultimately want to predict, which is a categorical, meaning there's low, medium, high, et cetera in there. Okay. So this is, at this point, just reading the CSV, making sure that I'm happy with that information. What I can then do, what I can then do is press continue. Come on, you can do it. Okay. Um, it's then asking me to choose the... Um, it's then asking me to choose the target. So this is the thing that I want to predict. And I can pick any, any of these fields that I want to have as my prediction. Um, and when I do that, you'll see it chooses a different algorithm to apply to that information. Now, the one I'm actually going to choose is, as I say, the one at the bottom, which is a categorical uh, field. In general, because if you think about it, with a categorical field, you're dealing with a smaller subset of information. So there are five or six categories to predict here versus the, 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 uh, the alternative where there are 20 different options uh, numerically, um, I'm much more likely to get a more, more accurate model at this point. But we'll come back to numbers later on. So I then accept everything, and it's now going to build my data source. Then I need to build the model. So this is telling it how to actually build the, uh, the process that's going to do my predictions. The important thing in here, really, is I'm accepting the defaults. It's taking 70% of my information to learn from. 30% will be the test of the information at the end of it. And I'm using all the default parameters. The only thing I want to point out here is that I'm actually then setting up 
10 data passes. So effectively, it's going to read that CSV and try its predictions 10 times, and then it's going to look at the, the balance between the two of those and see where we get to. So here we go. And then it runs off and it starts to build that data source. Now, another reason I videoed this rather than did it live is this process takes five to 10 minutes to run through, and, and you know, it's not very entertaining. I could do some karaoke or something, but it's probably not that entertaining. Um, so once this process is finished, I've got the data source built and I've got the model built. So I've actually got everything that I need to, to be able to, uh, to make the predictions here. Okay. And from that, um, I can then do what's called an evaluation. So if I just spin through here, so an evaluation will tell me how accurate my model is likely to be. So this is saying it's predicting the middle class has been predicted uh, where, where there's a middle result uh, it's given me an accurate result of um, whatever that was, uh, 82% there. So it's predicting results in the middle, 82% accuracy. So if you look at the blue blobs in the middle, those are the accurate numbers. So how accurate has it predicted against the training data that it's giving me? So here, uh, the correct for the low is 68%. Uh, whereas it mistakenly predicted high class for 12% or something on that. Okay. So you can see here, this is, this is basically the output telling me how accurate my prediction actually was in there. And it's not bad, not bad at all, um, considering that this is a totally automated process. Now, the truth is, of course, when I come to make an actual prediction. So on the right-hand side, I've got some other data, which wasn't fed through, and the expected result. So you can see the top one, for example, here. I'm expecting a result of middle. So I'm now entering in that information, and hopefully, although again, I videoed it, so I know the result here. <laughs> um, hopefully, it will come out with the result that I'm expecting. So this is, again, real-time prediction. It's like a test that I can do to see if these predictions are, uh, are accurate. And once I've done that, it runs off and it does its predictions, and it gives me an output, the output of which is exactly as predicted, middle. And it gives me the percentage chance of that um, being as predicted. So it's giving me a 98% chance of middle being the correct result there. Okay. Um, and I can repeat that with another one just to kind of validate this. Now, this part here where I'm just entering in the real-time information prediction, this is really just a tool for me to validate that this is correct. It doesn't have a practical application unless you want to type everyone in. Um, but as we'll see in a moment, you can also do a batch prediction on a whole CSV, or there is also uh, an API so you can take this and hook this into your own applications, your own LMS, and build this functionality into your own, uh, own system here. So we've got another one here. Low, it's predicted correctly with 98.7% chance of it being low. So the next step is, I think this is OK. I think this is good. Let's take a whole bunch of information and upload this and create um, a, a, a batch prediction. So I'm taking now a, another CSV, exactly the same as the previous one, except it's missing the target. So it's just the raw information that's in there. And it runs through exactly the same process, creating another data source here. And once I've actually built this, once I've actually built the data source in exactly the same way, I'm then able to run a batch prediction on here. Let me get you forward to the point where we're. So basically, the batch prediction is what I just said. It's taking a CSV without the target grades of however many thousand you want to put in. There's only about 20 in this one. Um, and it's saying, OK, let's run this against the actual model that we've just built, and let's run some predictions that come out here. So this will run through. And all I'm doing here, again, I'm just following. I'm not making any changes. I'm just following the default uh, wizard that goes through here, which is essentially saying, take this CSV that I've uploaded and run this model that I created earlier against it, and then output it to the destination it's going to go in here. It will cost me 10 cents, this process. I can run up to 1,000 predictions for 10 cents. So the cost of this is obviously not, not very high at this point. However, if you run 60 predictions, it will cost you 10 cents as well. So. So this runs off and it runs the process again. The process takes about, um, about, about 10, 15 minutes, depending on how much information you've got in there. And it will then generate the, uh, the batch process results at the end, which again is just a CSV file that you can download. 
And then when you open it up, um, I'll just spin through this a little bit. When you open it up, you can see on the right-hand side is the results file. So it's telling me the percentage chance for each student that it will score a particular, they will score a particular result. So here, on this particular one, the middle one has a 99% chance. On this one, the low one has a 99% chance in there as well. So it's looking like those predictions are reasonably accurate at the first glance. But what we need to do is to compile this into a, uh, let me compile this into a single document so we can see the final. On the left-hand side, you can see the two results side by side. The first one, the UNS score, is the actual score that they will have in reality. The second is the predicted score, uh, the score that the machine learning tool predicted. And as you'll see, in this case, they're all right. That doesn't mean they're always going to be all right. There are lots of things connected with this which can influence that information. But as an example of what's possible to achieve out of here, the more information you put in, the more accurate this will be. Obviously, the more specific the response you want, the less accurate um, that that will be. Okay. So we've actually been able to get here a reasonably accurate uh, perception. One thing to point out, though, is that in this particular example here, You'll see here, you can't really see quite so well, that's 98, that's 96%. So there was a, there was a kind of, there is an item there where, you're think, where you could easily think to yourself, well, okay, they're all right, but that was pretty close. How do we make it more, more accurate? How can we uh, make that more accurate? And one of the ways that you can make that more accurate is when you build the model at the beginning, if you remember, I just went through these screens very quickly, we got to this point where I accepted the default options. Well, there are a whole bunch of options that, um, even without having a machine learning background, data science background, you can actually begin to play around with these and make your model more accurate. One of the simplest ones is to increase the number of data passes. So in this example, we're just going to increase the number of data passes from the default of 10 to the default of 30. You have to be careful because there's a phenomenon called overfitting. And this is basically where you make your, you make your model match your test data so accurately that it fits that and doesn't necessarily create a good model for prediction. Um, but one of, the th one of the ways that you can look at this is, again, by going through the same process, by, uh, by doing an evaluation on the remodeled data. And when you do the evaluation, again, same thing, you come down to the same scores. And if I just pull this out now into this here, you can see the top one is the matrix for the, uh, for the 10 data passes. The bottom one is the matrix for the 30 data passes, so the second one, where I tried to make it more accurate. And what you'll notice there, hopefully, is that, for example, in the first one, middle was accurately predicted 24 times. In the bottom one, middle was accurately predicted, predicted 26 times. And then low 15 becomes 16, high 13 becomes 14, and very low 5, which was the maximum, becomes 5 anyway. So we have been able to go through a process just by making that one tweak of, uh, of making it more accurate. And we can see there that if we look at the same result, the high prediction has now been bottomed out in there as well. However, there is a limit to that because if we go up to 50 data points, which was the next step, you'll see that it actually, oops, you'll see actually it doesn't make any difference uh, whatsoever to the predictive accuracy in there. Okay. Now, Without wishing to, to dwell on this too much, because there's a couple of other things that I, I, um, that I want to show you. Um, taking another data set, so this is another data set which is just different here, a slightly different data set. Um, and this is quite interesting because it's, it's doing the same thing in that it's taking student data and it's asking for a predicted grade. Um, and this data set has a lot more, um, has a lot more, here we go has a lot more fields in it and a lot more information. And so this is basically a, a group of students over the course of a year, some information about them, much more generalized information, uh, talking about the school they went to, their sex, age, address, um, their guardian type, the amount of time they spend traveling, the amount of time they spend going out, uh, their course grades in semester one and semester two, um, a whole range of different pieces of information. Um, and again, you know, all of which has a, an impact on their environment as well as their education. 
What I want to do is to predict their G3, their third, their third grade in here. So what I'm after now is very much more specific. I'm after a specific, what is their predicted grade? Can be one to, I think this is one to 20 uh, in here. How accurately can I do that? It's numerical data, much broader spread. I actually have a very small data set of only 350 rows, so it is relatively small. However, um, I can run through this and I can create my, my predictions and then I can compare that with the, uh, with the actual results that were generated out. Now, to make this clearer, instead of just showing you the spreadsheet, what I want to do is take this into another tool within Amazon, which is called Amazon QuickSight, which is a BI tool, a charting tool. It allows you very quickly to generate charts based on, um, based on CSV. So if I just upload the CSV here, And I can then create an overview of the chart looking at how each student's scores compared with the, um, with the original score versus the predicted score. And there's some interesting things here, which is also why sometimes seeing these things visually allow you to pull out things that you hadn't expected. So one of the things you notice is there's not a perfect match here, obviously, but they're not, too, they're not too far away in most cases. And then suddenly you find some that really are too far away. There are three or four or five of these where they're way off beam. And so looking at this, I can then go back in and I can look at the reasons for that. Why is it that those scores are so wrong? What do I have to adjust in the model to make it right? And what I notice is that actually in all of those, the end result for the third, the third score was they scored zero. So potentially they missed the third event um, in there. And that's interesting because that tells me there's a piece of information that's clearly missing in my model that I need to put in there to make it work. So just to kind of summarize that, the, as I say, the aim here is you can take a very simple spreadsheet of information. As long as you are aiming for a, a or the broader the aim of the prediction that you want to put in, the, the, the more accurate it is. However, you can still get fairly accurate with uh, information. The more information you put in, the better. But this, is, again, is a self-service model. It's something that you can go in, you can play around with, you can look at, you can take the CSV in and, and upload. But as I say, you can also then plug it into your own applications, your own LMS, your own tools, or you can just take a spreadsheet of, of student results, feed it in one year, feed in the same information the next year, um, and, and the more information you have about the student, the more accurate that result is likely to be. So um, that's the first uh, type of uh, the first type of the three types of machine learning I want to show you. Um, obviously, there are loads of applications for learning, decision trees, you know, automated or physical decision trees, um, online training paths to be able to uh, automatically guide students through the training path they should go through. Recommendations, when you're looking at a whole group of people, what is it that you're looking to, you know, being able to predict where they are or where not. Uh, better staff retention, this is one that's being used a lot, which is where you can see patterns of people who are leaving and what are the reasons for that. And uh, assessment targeting, trying to target the right questions to the right people during the assessment phase to see where they failed or did not fail. So before I launch into number two, which is shorter, um, any questions? that I can take from the floor, please. Um, you mentioned there that 380 rows or whatever it was was a small number of rows. What, what do you think the smallest is that you go before it's not worthwhile? I think it, it really depends on your data. So the first one that I put in, so this, the second one with, the, um, with the, um, the broader set of numbers was 350 rows. The first one I put in was only 120 rows. Um, I mean, the, the only thing I would say is, the, the, the danger you have with, with the smaller rows is not so much that you won't get accurate predictions on some information, but you, might, you will be skewing the model so much towards that minimal amount of data in there as well. Any other? Hello. How do you know, how do you know what kind of data you take? What would you put in the spreadsheet? So, so the, the question really is, what is it that you want to, to understand? So if you want to understand, um, I, if I want to understand a student's grade purely based upon their performance in the school, then putting in the school or the, or the, 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 the company's information in there, um, the school, oh, blimey. <laughs> I think I was nodding off there. Um, 
the, 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 com the company information in there would, would be the vital thing. But if you want to do things in a more contextual way, so for example, you want to predict why people are leaving the company or why people aren't completing the course, in that particular case, you need to be adding in environmental information, like you know, what sort of background have they got. There are some very good studies, and actually within Amazon there is a downloadable study of looking at social factors on course progress. And, those, and, and it talks about that. But the real answer is, you know, that, that's kind of a question of domain expertise. What do you want to get to? How much do you feel this is influencing it? How, how accurately can you get the model? And if you find that actually by not including environmental information, your, 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 your predictions are more accurate, then that's what you should do. But if you find out that adding them in is more accurate, there's not really a hard and fast rule, is, is what I'm trying to say, because each prediction you're wanting to do is, is different. And is there any implication of data privacy with this course? Oh, yeah, there's always, there's always. So, so it's a good question. Is there any implication of data privacy coming GDPR and all that? The answer is. You put the data in here, and it's your, your Amazon account. And although it's in Amazon, you control all access to that data. So the implications to it are if you don't set up the account properly, or if you, for example, make your, the bucket, the folder that I showed you at the beginning, you, know, you have to make sure that you don't give global access to everybody for that. But actually, other than that, as long as you're securely controlling your environment, no, it doesn't go to Amazon. It doesn't go to anybody else at that point. It's all, all done within your environment. Amazon doesn't keep any copy of the data at all. And nor does Azure or Google Cloud or anybody like that. Um, so, the, the, you mean the number of columns, essentially. Yeah, so the number of columns, you can load in 500 columns at a point, um, and you can load in as many rows as you want. You don't have to load them all as, I've loaded them as one file, but you can put in multiple files as long as they've got the same format, and then instead of pointing to a file, you point to the folder in there. There is something else in there called SageMaker, which is a more advanced version of this, where you can have as many as you, well, I think as many, I mean, the, the, a massive limit anyway in terms of rows that you want. Um, you know, again, it's a question of how, what is it you want to get out of it at the end of it? And the thing I would say about SageMaker is it's not as self service and easy to use as this, but yes, so about fun. Okay. Yes, sorry. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm avoiding the, you know, yeah, fire away. That's right. right. Um, just a question about the data governance side. Um, so, uh, and I haven't looked at the new data governance laws. Um, GDPR. To yep. in May, but I know when we were collecting data from here in the UK, but it was the team was actually in the States, we had to be very careful in the way that we handled the data yeah. and the way that it was presented to us because when you start using people resources to handle the, the data, it makes a difference on where in the world they are. Right. That's that's no. That's that's absolutely fair comment and, and totally correct. So, so for those of you, I think most of you are probably aware, GDPR is the Global Data Protection uh, Protection um, General Data Protection Regulation. Regulation. Thank you, which comes in uh, in May, um, and and basically it governs uh, European data, um, and it changes the nature of what personal information is considered to be. So, so Amazon here, and I should have said this at the beginning, when you, when you upload your data into Amazon, you are choosing a region that you're doing your, your work in. And those regions, there are, there are about 14 major regions around the world, South America, North America, Europe, Asia, they, they are in everywhere. And there are new ones being added all the time. So, so this particular one that I was doing, I think, was in North Virginia. You'll see in the next one, it's in Ireland. There's Ireland, Frankfurt, London, Paris, and Europe that you can do, although whether London's in Europe is obviously open to contention, <laughs> sadly. Um, you know, and and so, so you're right. And, and the other thing to say in relation to that is if your data is not anonymized in any way, you have to get the explicit permission of everybody who's on that list in order to do that. So yeah, good, absolutely good point. And, the, and quite right, if you're going to ship it over to the States, um, you know, we, we, have a, we have a company in the States, and one of the things that, that we're, we're trying to manage is that exactly that regulation part there. So as well, yes, absolutely. And there was another question. Yeah. I'll ask a quick question. And these services from Google yep. are relatively inexpensive. Yes. Is it true that they, what are they getting out of it? So in other words, all of that infrastructure is pretty intense. 
the satisfaction of global. <laughs> <laughs> They're completely, I, you know, no. The serious answer is they are, for, for you or I running these services, they are very, very cheap to run. Um, but the scalability that they have means that they actually can make money out of even such a small, because actually the reality is, you know, they're not interested in somebody making 10 cents out of it, but if you were suddenly to build an application in Amazon that then ran 20,000 queries a day, used their infrastructure, scales up, and, and you know, that's obviously really important. I guess your question is also about, is this a model where they take your information in exchange for? Um, so, um, no, they don't capture information specifically about anything specific. What they do capture is about the, the, the stuff that would, would appear in your billing. So for example, this company ran 75,000 queries a day. That then gets aggregated and anonymized into their data set. But it's not quite the same model as Google marketing or, or Amazon Prime. Yeah, OK. Um, are there any freewares in the market that I could use just to see how the, these modeling techniques can be used for my benefit in the organization and then I go to the enterprise level later for some moment? But I just want to see how it can come to my benefit. So, so, so what I say is I think AWS is so, and Google and all of them, are, are so cheap it, to, to even just, you can sign up and there's a free tier. So you can do it. You can sign up and start using them straight away. There's a free tier, and that gives you, in each different service, it gives you, and each service is different, but it gives you, for example, 10,000 requests in the first year that you can use free. And, and even when you get to paying, I mean, everything that I show you today, in total, will have cost about 20 cents. It's all billed in dollars. Um, so so the, the cost of it isn't. What you, what, what you can also do is when you set it up, you can set a limit on the amount of money that you want to spend. And that can be as little as $2. So there's not really a, um, the, 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 the other answer to it is there are various tools out there that you can use and download um, to do. I don't know that they're any as simple to use as this. Um, and, and the time that you would take to download them and, and use them and configure them probably would be more than $2 worth of your time to do. So, um, but yes, at that point when you want to scale up to the enterprise level, then you look at the, the whole cost structure. Because, you know, it is fair to say that you can incur large costs if you're doing large amounts of, of yeah, data. Really yeah. What, what I would say, though, is every tool that you download and every time you use a service, a different service, it's got a slightly different model, a slightly different. So, so if you're looking to model it for a potential for the use, I'd suggest you use whichever one of the ones you think might be the most successful. Or try five of them and look at the results you get from, from there. There are loads of, also, just to say, there are loads and loads of um, open data sets that are available to be used. If you, if you just uh, Google UCI, or, you see, uh, or machine uh, learning repositories and so on. There are lots of things out there that you can use. OK, I'm going to crack on. Uh, two, more, two more pieces that I really want to show you. And, um, how am I doing? <laughs> OK, um, OK, natural language processing. So, so this is a second. This is a tool called Comprehend. And this is basically, let me summarize it by saying it's a huge thing. Most people know Alexa in your house. Hey, Alexa, how are you? Um, one of the core things that allows Alexa to work is the ability to be able to process large amounts of data and to be able to make semantic sense. So not just take a word and, and translate that into a series of, of uh, phonemes. It's the ability to make semantic sense from a piece of, of text, whether that's written or spoken. Natural language processing is an important part of that and allows you then to start to make predictions about the content of a piece of writing, the content of a piece of text, the content of a piece of spoken word, and also the sentiment of a piece of uh, spoken language. Um, so there are two parts to this, one of which is topic modeling. Topic modeling is essentially taking a piece of text and saying, yeah, I think this has this, 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 and this topic in it. This piece of text is about these 25 things. Um, so let me take you into, immediately into a practical example of this. Um, and what I'm going to do here, just to give you the best, um, the best example of this, is I'm going to take you straight through to an example here, which I think is the best way of showing you this. So there are two different parts to Amazon Comprehend. And again, this is um, free tier. It also is, um, I think it's 0.001 cents per request you make. 
This is their trial area. Again, you can build this into your application and so on. And, and this is essentially what it does under the hood. So here we go. I'm going to take some text. This text is taken from a sixth form history essay. Um, and not written by me, I hasten to add. Sixth form was a very long time ago. I, I analyze it, and it picks out those keywords. Henry IV, Richard II, 1400, Hotspur, Percy, 1403, uh, um, 1400, and so on. Um, so it's picking out the core text entities in there. Um, and it's then able to, to locate those. So again, and, and this doesn't just work on one document. It can run on 1,000 documents in about two minutes. Um, it picks out key phrases, so phrases that it thinks are important. Uh, and those are phrases that give weight to something. So those are the things that allow you to make judgments on the quality of the work. But also they allow it to make predictions, as you'll see in a moment, about the sentiment of something. Um, so this, uh, these two pieces of information are extracted from a document very, very quickly. And then it's also able to recognize the language that the document was written in. It actually only does English and Spanish at the moment. Uh, in the Amazon version, the Azure version has slightly more flexibility in terms of language. And then at the bottom, it's able to recognize the sentiment. Um, it's, if I move my mouse. Um, it's able to predict whether this is a positive, a negative, a neutral, or a mixed reaction um, thing. We've, we've been doing a marketing project recently where we've been using this to apply to tweets where we've been looking at tweets around a particular subject and generating kind of marketing response to a particular instance. Different ways of viewing this, exactly the same information, just viewed in a different way. And then, um, and again, you know, being able to locate those, that information in a particular piece of text, also quite interesting. Um, now, the true thing here is how do we get the sentiment? How, do we, how good is the sentiment engine? So what I've done here is I've gone to The Guardian and I've taken two reviews of The Last Jedi, very controversial, um, one of which was very good, one of which was not so good, uh, and we're going to plug these through. So this is quite a positive one. I was lucky I had a chance to introduce my five-year-old daughter to Leia, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I'm going to apply this the same thing. It's going to run off and do its analysis. If I get the right text. I kept in the mistake just to show you it's live recorded and not fudged. Okay. And you can see here it's picked out key terms, five-year-old Leia, Star Wars, Ray, today, um, just as before, picking out generational joy, key phrases there, language. And it's saying that there's a 46% chance of it being neutral, a 38% chance of it being positive, or 38% of it is positive in there. So it's beginning to, and, and it's clearly not uh, a, a negative uh, review. So it's been able to pick that out quite well. Here's another one, which is a very negative review. I was kind of just interested to see how it handled Bantha Pudu, really, to be honest. And you'll see here again, it runs through, does exactly the same thing, picks out the key words, and 68% of it is a negative review. So it's being able to get that information. Now, you know, clearly, having that information and being able to use that information is important in a number of ways. It gives you key phrases to be able to use. It gives you a conglomeration of textual information that you can analyze in a large corpus of information. But it also gives you the ability to be able to understand um, the, the, the sentiment behind a, uh, a, a piece of text and to predict, um, potentially, the results coming out of that as well. The other part of it, which I, I skipped over there slightly, but just to mention, the topic modeling, um, I, I won't go into great detail, but what I will say is that um, what topic modeling does is it generates a list of topics that are covered in a particular group of, of files. So I put in 2,000 movie reviews. Out of those 2,000 movie reviews, it broke it down into 49 different topic areas. And those topic areas are defined by keywords that appear into those different areas. So it's very easy and exciting to be able to isolate content types in there as well. And again, there are a whole bunch of, um, a whole bunch of, of learning um, applications in there, whether it's summarizing text 
looking for repeated failures of success and uh, repeated patterns of success and failure. So analyzing text where one is successful, one is not. Understanding issues and responses, help bots, sentiment analysis that I mentioned as well. So, and, and it's just to, to kind of say that it's the same thing. It's analyzing large quantities of data in a very fast way by the scale that you're able to put machines up to nowadays in a cost-effective way to be able to deliver um, these, these sorts of predictions. So, any questions relating to that particular one? Man, I'm just thinking, um, can we mix data? Can we take like learning data or training data and mix it with like customer service or help desk or? Yeah, so, so basically the text, the text that you put in there is a TXT file, it's a text file. So what, what content you actually put into those files, absolutely you can. I mean, clearly, I think what, what, it, what I would expect in that situation is that it would separate those out into different topic areas. That would be quite interesting if it didn't, you know, to see what those, what those links were. So that would be quite interesting. But yes, essentially, you can take any textual information you want and you can put it in there. You either put it in one massive file and you say each line is a new text item, or you put it in a document and each document is a new text item. Doesn't take very long. 2,000 documents took about two minutes to process the whole thing start to, to finish. So it's, it's pretty quick. And the reason for that is because how Amazon works is it scales really quickly. So if you had a traditional environment and you wanted to run this process, you'd buy five servers. If you do it on Amazon, it basically says, OK, I need five servers for two minutes, boom, and then shuts down. OK. So. Something came up, JSON. Yes. What's that? So that's magic. Um, that's, so, so, so basically, that, that bit is the bit that allows you to connect your. So, so, in itself, that's kind of quite a fun tool sitting in Amazon. You can go there, you can try it out. But the real value for it is you can take that and you can hook it into other systems. And that, that squiggly bit, that JSON, is the bit that communicates between Amazon and your other systems. So, it allows it to communicate between the two things. That's the kind of machine conversation output, if you like it. Uh, JavaScript open notation, object notation, sorry. So, so. I've got a little question on a journey to uh, create something that will be able to interpret written text. Yes. And say, is it right or is it not right? Okay. How far on the journey am I I'm starting to use this? Am I really at the beginning just to sort of interpret? What do you mean by right? Right, so, so I, think, I think this is a good first step for it. And I think like any machine learning tool, it's the training of that tool that, that matters. So as you're doing your topic modeling, you're feeding in more information, you're making it more accurate over time. You know, 2,000 documents, for example, is not very many to build a corpus of knowledge. But, but you are 25% along the way by using something like this that actually is a painful 25% to have to do to do yourself. Probably you want to ingest the data that comes out of it and manipulate that in some way to be more accurate, but definitely it's, it's, a, good, it's a good step along the way. 15 minutes <laughs> Okay. All right. So I will keep this, this one quite brief. Speech recognition. Speech recognition, I won't summarize all this. Everyone knows this is Alexa. This is, you know, the, the whole, uh, the whole uh, speaker process where you can speak to your speaker and it will come back to you. Um, that's, Alexa is obviously a, an, Amazon, uh, an Amazon tool. The, uh, and the core thing that drives it is another machine learning part, another AI part, which is called uh, Lex, surprisingly. And this is built on the foundation. It allows you to take the spoken word that you input and allows you to create conversational, in this case, conversational bot. This is a very simple one, which in, in the case of what I'm about to demonstrate will guide your learners through a path, but it's using all the things that have been seen before. So um, let me, let me um, run through this very simply. It's only six minutes, so I can do it. Um, so here I am, I'm creating my bot. And remember, what I'm actually doing is creating a series of predictions that I want to be made, a, a series of tools that Hello, allow my- Hello, my name is Joanna. Hello, my name is Matthew. Hello, my name is Ivy. 
and I'm very creepy. <laughs> Hello, my name so, is Joanna. So, okay, so this is the voice I'm going to use, uh, and there are some child protection things that you have to put in there. But effectively, this is going to allow me to create a conversation. But what's really exciting is what's happening underneath it, which is that I'm, I'm putting in phrases, but I can use close phrases, I can use any phrase to allow me to perform actions. So I'm going to create what's called an, in, a, a, an intent. So this is basically how do I start this, this little bot off. And I can use any phrase I want to. I can use serious phrases or I can use silly phrases in here. I'm just creating the initial vocabulary of the bot, really. And because there's so much kind of information gone on under the hood, learning about pronunciation, it's recording, as you know, as you may not know, uh, Alexa's recording voices all the time, and all of that's being fed into this massive piece of machine learning. So it's learning how each sound works, and then it's being fed into this. So that I can even put in a really crazy uh, context unaware uh, sentence. And it should still recognize it, as we'll test at the end. Now, any conversation is made up of a series of questions and answers. So I'm going to put two in here, one of which is, what city would you like to learn about? And then, which goes here. And then here, in what's called the slot type, it gives me the option to create the potential responses. And these responses grow over time. So if, for example, I choose a European city, then that's a fixed finite number of, of options. If I have something much broader, so for example, I'm going to, in a moment, choose subject, that will grow over time as people put in different inputs as well. Um, so it's learning and adapting all the time. So my second question is, oh, hang on, I've got to create my, sorry, I'm creating here the, the subject types that I'm allowed to. So I want to learn about Berlin language. I want to learn about Paris history. Those are the options that I'm, I'm giving here. And it's going to interpret my, and this would also work with Alexa, it's going to interpret my text, it's going to understand everything I've said, and it's going to make a prediction coming out of there. Okay. So I've got two questions. I could have 50 questions um, in there. And then the final step is once I've made my requests, I want to be able to confirm that the information that I've got is correct. So my two requests are, uh, what city would you like to learn about? And would you like to learn about the history or language of that city? OK. So then I add in a final confirmation prompt, which is basically where Alexa is going to uh, is going to ask me the question or, or give me the response, which it, well, I'm going to say, OK, so you want to learn about language in Lisbon. OK, so you want to learn about whoops, history in Paris, just to confirm that what I want is correct. Okay. Now, bear in mind, and, and just in answer to the question of how private is your data, the one thing which came up earlier on, the one thing that, that should be said is, as with any like Alexa or anything like that, the same thing applies here, your voice will be used as part of the analysis that goes on to feed the, not specifically recorded and identified as you, but goes into the corpus of data that's being used to improve that service all the time, your pronunciation. Okay. So I'm ready to rock and roll with this. I'm going to build it. Again, this takes five minutes or so, so I've sped it up a little bit. And then I'm going to publish it and test it out. This can then be published, obviously tested here, can be published to any mobile application, any web page involved in, anybody uses Slack or any messaging system, you can build it into there as well. So it can be used in an awful lot of places. Let's test it out. Uh, I'd like to learn about a city. So it's matching one of my first criteria. Which city would you like to learn about? Uh, London. Would you like to learn about the history or language of this city? History, please. History, please. Notice that okay, it's not so you just want to learn about the history the of London? Yes. Thank you. We recommend that you take the course called the History of London, which can be found at the following location: https colon slash slash and wikipedia.org slash wiki slash history underscore of underscore London. Yeah, it's a <laughs> snappy. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> can you repeat Sorry, that, please? Can you please repeat that? Oh. 
Okay. And then even when you're using a silly phrase... Give me some city facts, baby. Which city would you like to learn about? Lisbon. Would you like to learn about the history or language of this city? Language. Okay, so you want to learn about the language of Lisbon? Yes, I do. Thank you. We recommend that you take the course called BBC Portuguese course, which can be found at the... So the point there is it's using all of that stuff under the hood in order to generate uh, this, which can then be used in building your own... Uh, well, I mean, you know, here we're clearly using for course recommendation. Could also be used, obviously, for help desk. Could also be used for feedback after a session, um, etc. And if I'd been really smart, I would have built one for you guys to leave feedback after the session, but I didn't. Um, you know, and, and for things like that. And also, these are not discrete. They can all be hooked in. Uh, they can all be hooked in together into different uh, different elements as well. Um, and, and I should also say, just as one, one, um, one last thing here, that there is also another set, which is a set of image recognition, which does all the things you would expect it to do with image recognition. It allows you to identify facial features. It allows you to identify objects in an image. It allows you to identify famous celebrities. Um, although it mistook my image for Nigel Farage, which I was about to say about, to be honest. Um, it allows you to uh, also do the same thing on video and, and analyze what's in particular frames of video as well. So all of these tools together um, are based, as I say, on exactly the same thing. They're all based on the notion that, um, they're all based on the notion that you can um, very easily bring forward a whole bunch of data. All of that data is used and amassed and used either at a very simple level for prediction or it's used in a very agile way to predict what you're going to say, to predict the output of an image and so on from there. So um, let, me, let me throw it open for, for one last uh, set of questions um, from anybody. If anybody has any questions, either about any of the specific items that I've shown that, that, or, or about in more general terms, more than happy to, to answer them. Yes. Yeah. We're actually creating a bot. Yep. So why the hell can't I just speak my text into the... It's a really good question. Uh, you know, it probably come, but... I, I, I think the... It, it's really painful, I agree. Especially my typing and my finger. <laughs> it's like, um, no, it's a really good question. I mean, I suspect the answer is that, that you know, that, that Amazon are very good at building the tools... Whereas, and so is everybody else, whereas what you're talking about is the tools to wrap the tools. And I think you're right. Somebody somewhere, probably someone in this room, will go away and build a system that allows you to build a system verbally, and that would be great. That's it, yeah. I've got it already. I'm already online. You know. Anybody else? Any other questions? Yes. Yep. So. Yep. So how does that play into um, data? So when we think about that, I think we get stuck on data types. Yes. Images like that are like the next. Abs thing. Yeah, com completely. I mean, so so all of those sorts of things is basically it's break. I mean, ultimately it's break it. Break Ultimately, it's breaking down images into a, a, a series of maps of either very small pixel matches, and then also the next level of context mapping of each of those pixels. So it's exactly the same as when you have a, um, when you have a phrase and you say, uh, I don't know, I, I'm, I'm leaving or I'm not leaving or you know, getting the whole phrase. And it's exactly the same thing there, I think, with you know, what, what you say is right. It's, it's actually a higher level of data and much more about the association of different pieces of data in order to, to, to manage that and to map that. But yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's a really good application of what's happening today, for sure. Okay. I suppose the, what, you're, what you're leveraging here is all the data that's been collected through all the Alexas and uh, Echoes and so on. So it's, it's learning everything in the background, you're just leveraging that. Yeah, I mean, you are. I mean, I, th I think with the, 
with the audio stuff for sure, with the image recognition as well. It's from, there are thousands of image recognition libraries that have been going on for a long, long time. Um, and, and so all of that information that's in there. And actually, if you look again, if you search, there are loads of open source data sources for image recognition as well. Um, but it is, I mean, and that's the whole point about all of these systems, that they are machine learning in the truest form. Everything you do to build your tools on top of it is adding to the corpus of, of information that's in there. Although, in, again, I stress, in an anonymized way so that you're not actually feeding in personal information unless somebody's made a mistake. Anything else? Okay, so let me, let me just say um, thank you very much for joining us and um, thank you to, to Neil. If anybody wants any further information, feel free to grab one of my beautifully transparent um, business cards here. We're more than happy to pick up. Otherwise, um, I'll hand back over to Neil. Thank you very much. So, so I'm going to go home and tell Alexa to create me um, a, a voice recognition bot. <laughs> Let's see how successful that is. I yeah, think that get, would be the ultimate get them to thing. Think, well, she already talks to us when yeah. um, we're not talking to her. It's yeah. distinctly weird. It is. You're, just, you're in the kitchen and suddenly she's talking to herself. It's the middle of the night and it wakes up and goes, hello, honey, how are you? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, um, that, that's really interesting. That the, what I, I, I wasn't expecting was the topic of predictive analytics leading us into that sort of territory. So I've personally found that really interesting and relatable to stuff that is going on for us all now and particularly in relation to the learning piece that I think the, um, the whole idea of the, the, the bot um, for, for learning, I think I mean, Alexa's already doing that for yeah. me, um, getting definitions of words uh, and things like that, spell such and such for me. Yeah. Um, I laughed when she came up with the HTTPS or yeah. there because I've asked her for phone numbers and I've had to ask her four times just so I can catch yes, it and that's write very it down. True. So there's still that the difference between it being natural. It's it's still like it is still a long way yeah. from truly yeah. interact to, truly natural, yeah. We can see it coming. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Absolutely. And and in a good way. Oh yeah, yeah. No, I'm a big fan. Yeah. And I think that's a, a good positive message for us all to take away. Um, it's the end of the day. Please remember, apparently, there is a feedback bot um, so for, the, for the conference, which I've just remembered. I don't know any of the details of it, but do seek it out and use the feedback voice bot to give your feedback back to the conference. Matt, great session. Thank, thank you, you very much. much. Thank Would you, you show much. your thank appreciation? You. Thank you.